Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, I am Katie Horner, the LLM Fellow for the Environmental Law Program at the Elizabeth Aub School of Law. Before we begin today's event, I'd like to provide you all with a few announcements. Today's event will include a brief moderated Q&A session with our presenter, Roger Martella. We'll be using a web application called Slido to coordinate the Q&A. To participate in the Q&A session, simply click on the link provided in the chat and enter the code. Type and submit your question into the submission box on the Slido page. To share your thoughts about today's event and stay connected with us for future programming, tag and follow us on Twitter. To learn more about past Curlin lectures, please visit the link provided in the chat. Lastly, I'd like to remind you all that today's event is being recorded. Uh, thank you all again for joining. We will begin the event momentarily. At this time, I would like to invite Professor Jason Zarneski, the Associate Dean and Executive Director of the Environmental Law Program and the Curlin Distinguished Professor of Environmental Law to open the event. Professor Zarneski. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 2022 Gilbert and Sarah Curlin Lecture on Environmental Law. Uh, thank you, Katie, for the introduction. As she said, I'm Jason Zarneski, Associate Dean of the Environmental Law Program at the Elizabeth Haub School of Law at Pace University. It's really my sincere pleasure and privilege to welcome you all and our distinguished guest lecturer to this annual event. Now I would like to pass the virtual podium uh, to the Dean of the Law School, Horace Anderson. Thank you, Professor Zarneski. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Horace Anderson, Dean of the Elizabeth Howe School of Law at Pace University, and I am honored to kick off our virtual Gilbert and Sarah Curlin Lecture on Environmental Law this year. We are pleased to have with us today Roger Martella, Chief Sustainability Officer for General Electric, the well-known American multinational conglomerate and the largest industrial company in the US. His talk will focus on a topic that is very much of the moment, corporate social responsibility and the role of corporations in solving climate change and pursuing sustainability. The Elizabeth Haub School of Law established the Gilbert and Sarah Curlin Lecture on Environmental Law to expand its program of research, education, professional and scholarly activity and publications in environmental law, a field for which the law school has received national and international recognition. The Curlin Endowment funds a named professorship in environmental law at the law school. Professor Nicholas A. Robinson, founder of our environmental programs, was named the first Curlin Distinguished Professor in 1999. Professor Jason Sarneski was designated the second Curlin Distinguished Professor in 2013. The last Curlin lecture was given by Elizabeth Maruma Marema. Secretary of the Convention on Biological Diversity. I'm proud that Howe Laws is home to the number one ranked environmental law program in the nation. And we consistently host top scholars, attorneys, and experts from around the world to speak to our community about current environmental challenges and solutions. Here at the law school, we recently launched our Sustainable Business Hub, a program which aims to explore and support the role of business and business lawyers in achieving sustainability. We now look forward to welcoming Mr. Martella to speak about the importance of sustainability in the corporate context. I'd now like to turn the screen over to Professor Katrina fisher Koop, how Distinguished Professor of Environmental Law and a former recipient of the Gilbert and Sarah Curlin Lecture Award. She will introduce our Distinguished Curlin Lecturer and serve as today's Q&A moderator, Professor. Thank you so much, Dean Anderson. I am uh, honored to have the privilege of introducing Roger Martella. He joined General Electric in 2017 as the Director and General Counsel for Environmental Health and Safety, and was later promoted to his current role of Chief Sustainability Officer. 
Prior to joining the team at GE, Roger co-led Sidley Austin's Global Environmental Law and Climate Change Practices. He also, just to round things out, served as General Counsel of the Environmental Protection Agency and Principal Counsel for Complex Litigation at the, at the Department of Justice's Natural Resources section. So I think he's officially checked all of the important boxes uh, as an environmental law practitioner. Roger is known for being incredibly generous in sharing his time and expertise with a number of organizations. He serves on the board of the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions, the Environmental Law Institute, and several environmental NGOs and energy think tanks. Personally, I've had the pleasure of working with Roger in his capacity as the education officer for the ABA section on environment, energy, and resources. As an aside, after two years of helming virtual events, I have to imagine that Roger is excited that ABA Sears 51st Spring Conference on Environmental Law is scheduled to be held in person in San Francisco in April. The conference focuses on the future of environmental law. My Money Says it will be a great group who are all gonna be really excited to see one another, so be there or be square. In addition to his professional and public service, Roger is also a scholar. He's co-authored and edited four books on the intersections of ESG, climate change law, international environmental law, and human rights, including co-editing the recently published Corporate Social Responsibility, Sustainable Business, Environmental, Social, and Governance Frameworks for the 21st Century. Roger graduated from Cornell University and Vanderbilt University Law School, and he's presently teaching a first-of-its-kind class on international environmental law and justice at Howard University Law School. So with that, I will turn the floor over uh, to our Kerlin lecture for 2022, Roger Martella. Uh, thank you, Professor Q, for that wonderful introduction for Roger Martella. Um, and before we get to Roger's remarks, we have one important item, and that is to present the 2022 Gilbert and Sarah Kerlin Lecture Award to him, which we give always to our, our speakers. Um, as you can see on your screen, Roger, uh, this is the medal uh, that you uh, maybe have received in the mail already. If it might have been delayed due, to, due, due to, the, to, the, to the post and the weather. Oh, fabulous. The medal uh, displays a topographical depiction of Storm King Mountain, uh, paying homage to the landmark Second Circuit case of Scenic Hudson Preservation Conference versus Federal Power Commission, a ruling that inaugurated what we call today environmental law. This topographical rendering of Storm King also serves as the logo of Pace Environmental Law's program. And the award now bearing Mr. Martella's name on the back uh, was, as you can see, sent to him. And I'm glad it reached him in time. So uh, Roger, I now invite you to deliver the 2022 Gilbert and Sarah Curlin Lecture uh, on, it, on how the corporate sector can improve its environmental, social, and governance impacts uh, while generating innovative ways to solve our global environmental challenges like climate change and environmental injustice. So Roger, uh, thank you again. I'm glad the medal and award got to you in, in time and we look forward to your lecture. Well, Dean Anderson, my, my good friend, Professor Q, Professor Zerneski, uh, my friend of Cynthia and Katie, thank you for this, this opportunity. And I, I was not expecting a medal or an award or anything like that. And so I, when the package showed up, um, I kind of, left it all day and then finally said someone who said you can go ahead and open it. it it's incredibly moving and, and touching and I, I'm looking forward to um, re really learning more about it and I'm, thank you for connecting the dots on, on the logo which I hadn't appreciated either so thank you for that it was not necessary but very generous and I, I greatly appreciate it and this is really particularly meaningful for me um, given the opportunity that I've had to work with Elizabeth Howe School of Law at Pace over the years my relationship with the law school really started at EPA um, when I, I showed up and there's these, you know, the smartest environmental lawyers in the world work at, work at EPA. And I, I kept learning, where do you go to law school? Where do you go to law school? And, and so many of them went to PACE and, and, and carried that legacy. So I took a really strong interest. We always made uh, an effort every year when we re could recruit four or five people, we'd always want to recruit someone from, from PACE. And as I've moved on in my career, um, it, it's very common for me to, to run into somebody who is incredibly smart and strategic and presents so well, but also very humble, which I think is very important. And for them to, to remind me that they, they went to PACE. So um, this takes on a special significance for me to the students who, who have signed in today, who've chosen to sign in. Um, congratulations on, on being part of this environment, your commitment to lead in the future. You're gonna be joining 
a remarkable group of lawyers uh, and leaders. I'd also like to thank my, my students at, at Howard Law School who, unlike everybody else in this call, didn't have the option of calling in. We're actually uh, requiring this to kick off our sustainability section of our class in a, in a, in a week or so here. But uh, Howard has entrusted me with about 20 of their law students. I'm very proud of that. And we're focused as Professor Q said on a first of its kind class on international environmental justice. We're using it as a training ground to make a difference in the world. And it's really been so uplifting and inspiring for me to pick up on the enthusiasm of the students at the class. And I always go in every Monday morning a little stressed out about it, making sure I'm well prepared and always walk away, um, just feeling so energized by the discussion in the class and these students. And I wanna thank Pace for inviting them, making them part, making them feel welcome today. Um, I know they appreciate it as, as do I. So, so two years ago, uh, back in 2019 and 2020, we had the chance to reflect, many of us did, on this important milestone of 50 years of environmental law, environmental protection in the United States that started roughly around 1970. This was true for PACE too. Uh, the ABA held a climate change conference at PACE in January of 2020. I had the opportunity to, to be invited by the ABA to be the keynote speaker. And I had a pretty provocative uh, proposition at the time. And my, my proposition was, we really needed transformational change in the climate to solve climate change. That the pace of progress um, with the law was not keeping up with the challenges in climate and that the tools that had served us well in the past simply weren't working. So I'd urge, the, urge us to think differently about it, to use different tools in the toolbox. And then a few weeks later, I could not have predicted this. Of course, we all went into lockdown over COVID. Uh, I think uh, Westchester County was one of the first to really feel those impacts. And in a way that I could not have foreseen, COVID effectively became kind of a catalyst for the changes I was searching for. And it's, today what I do, want to do is reflect on how much these two years have changed and how much momentum we're building. So that's my theme. As we enter the second half century of environmental movement, environmental law, we're really living today a fundamental transformation, a change in the who and the what and the how and the when of environmental progress. And specifically, of course, you've seen the headline, the rise of corporate social responsibility and this disruption in the system. I think this is very positive. I think we're gonna feel optimistic. This is how we can make progress in solving these issues. The challenges are harder. The tools are better tailored to them. And I think we're gonna see strong progress. And I know this is provocative. Um, I've gotten many emails from many people who've been you know, telling me how many emails are circulating about this. So I, I know this is provocative. And if we were in person, everybody would be very polite. You can't walk out of the room. It's easier to hit the leave button on Zoom. But before you do that, let me just turn to the next slide because I want you to know this is not just my view. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. This is from the Edelman Trust uh, Barometer. And I didn't create this slide. This is cut and paste directly from them. I want you to focus on the second. This is just from three weeks ago, by the way. I want you to focus on the second line here. Business still the only trusted institution, the only one that meets the threshold for trusted institutions. Now, I want to be clear. If you dig deep into the report, we don't do so well in environmental stuff. Other, other people tend to lead. But this is the overall result. And I'm not here to say corporations are gonna solve this, quite the opposite, we'll hear that. But, but what I do think this reflects, it's not just me, but as the world is facing these kind of more impactful, more formidable challenges, I think this is a reflection that the people who are impacted by this, and this is, this is 36,000 respondents in 28 countries. This is not just the US, this is a global study. The folks who are seeing these impacts, frankly, they're, they're, they're counting on businesses to lead the solutions here. I think they've seen some of that with COVID. And it just reinforces kind of why we're having this discussion today and what's coming ahead. So with that, if we can go to the next slide, please. Katie, thank you. Um, I wanna start off with just one definition. It's the only time I'm gonna do this, which is I'm not here just to talk about corporations. I'm, I've been very careful to say, I'm here to talk about corporate social responsibility. And in, to me, that's more than just companies. We're gonna talk about companies and their role. But one of the themes I hope you leave with today is part of this transformation, it's not just companies. We have a broader group of stakeholders engaged in this process than we've ever had in the past in the history of environmental law. Employees, investors, customers, communities, NGOs, governments, and all those actors too. And that's part of the driving difference. So I just wanna, I'll, I'll point out a couple of times I'm gonna talk about companies, and a couple of times I talk about corporate social responsibility, but when I'm using the broader term, it's this broader sense of partnership of all these groups working together. And that's what's credited with this progress. It's not just about companies. We have an important role to play, but it's more than companies. 
So let's go ahead and jump into it. I'm gonna cover three things today if we can move to the next slide. I wanna give a really brief summary because I think this has to set the stage on the last 50 years where we've come from, what worked, what hasn't, how corporate social responsibility has evolved from the beginning, starts longer than you probably think, up until the last two years where it's completely intensified as um, Professor said. said. And then the how it's, it's gonna impact the who, the what, the how and when of, of, of these issues going forward. So let's go to the next slide, please. And we'll start with the first 50 years of environmental progress and we'll skip to the next one. So I, I think this will probably be pretty familiar proposition to any student of environmental law, at least the first part of this. And what we see is, you know, the environmental legal movement really started roughly around 1970. We can debate things California was doing, other things that pre predate that, but roughly 1970. And, and what we saw in these early days was a lot of activity, a united front, the notion we had really hard problems to solve but government kind of stepping up and being willing to make the compromise, come together in a bipartisan way to create the framework for solving these issues. So we saw lots of progress because government was giving the tools that people needed to do it. So you see this flurry of activities with law after law, you know, for the first decade or so. And then it kind of stops, then it kind of slows down for a while. And there's been some things since, but you know, we had the Lautenberg Act back in 2016. But but the notion of kind of this theme we had in the beginning of progress and bipartisanship and compromise, we haven't seen that in a long time. But in 2007, the, the, the tables kind of turned again when the Supreme Court stepped in and said, even though there's no laws to address climate change, we think EPA can address climate change under its existing laws under the Clean Air Act. So this seemed like we were entering a, sec a second era of environmental law and that there would be all this activity around EPA to address greenhouse gases. But if we, if we play that out, out over the rules that come, come forward here, you know, from 2007 on, the progress has been you know, relatively flat. There was been some good work on regulating cars and trucks and things like that. Efforts to regulate the energy sector, which probably went beyond the bounds of the law. And now what we have an oral argument coming up in three weeks in the Supreme Court, a lot of buzz about whether the Supreme Court could actually ratchet back some of this authority. So not only has it been relatively flat, if we're looking at the role of government, it could, it, it, there's some possibility, depending on what happens in three weeks here with the oral argument in West Virginia versus EPA, whether there could actually be some, some backwards momentum. So if we go to the next slide and put this all in the context, what we really have then are two eras. We have the conventional environmental protection era, lots of progress, lots of compromise uh, working together. And then we have greenhouse gases where things have stayed relatively flat. So let's, let's dissect that and understand kind of the different players and so on. So if we go to the next slide, you know, if we look at the, the theme, so the catalysts were the same. Both eras were started by NGOs, started by activist groups. The actors were the same. Government kind of taking the lead in both eras. The goals, a bit different, addressing conventional environmental protection, protecting people in the first era on greenhouse gas era, addressing global climate change, addressing the challenge of this global kind of protracted issue uh, that really impacts the planet kind of holistically. Uh, we used the same tools we had, the Clean Air Act, command and control type approaches, but the politics had changed. And just to put that in the context, um, Professor Q gave a bit of my background. I was hired by a Democrat administration. I was promoted by a Democrat administration. I was nominated to the Senate by a Republican administration. I was unanimously confirmed by the Senate, 100 votes Republican Democrat back in 2006. I don't think that could happen today. I think, I think in that short period of time, 15 years later, the world has changed so dramatically that no matter who you are, or what your qualifications might be, Republican, Democrat connections to both, um, we're just not at that point. And so there's been this more polarized environment and we've seen this change in the success as I've spoken about. So we're gonna come back to this, but this sets the table for what we're gonna talk about. So if we go to the next part here, we're gonna talk about corporate social responsibility now and where this all fits in. So if we go to the next slide, Here's the really brief history of corporate social responsibility. And I do want to thank uh, Dean Irma Russell, my, my very good friend at University of Missouri Law School, who her and I worked on a project that this kind of emerges out of. And she's the one who did all the heavy research on this and helped me figure this out. But one of the things I want to say that may be a little surprising is that the notion of corporations and corporate social responsibility starts with the purpose of the corporation itself. This surprised me when I was working on this with Dean Russell. If you go back to 1819, in the Supreme Court saying the very purpose of a corporation, the charter is to do public good. Prior to a corporation, you had um, partnerships and you had sole proprietorships. 
then what would happen is you might create a great company. It might be doing a charitable purpose, but when that person died, so did the entity. And so both in, the, in Britain and later in the United States, the courts looked to corporations to create entities that could survive one person because they thought it was important to do public good. And that was, that was important part of the institution. So the very foundation for corporations goes back to this theme of public good. It's not a new theme from like 2019. It goes back to 1819. And then over the years we saw, you know, people start to say, well, let's look beyond just the, the shareholder return. Let's look at corporate social responsibility, the impacts of a company on the communities where it operates, on its employees, on the environment. So you see in the 1930s and 1950s, we start to see that evolve as themes. And in the 1950s, we see the rise of multinational companies, all the power that comes with that. A lot of companies more powerful, more resourceful than the very countries where they're operating. In 2006, the United Nations starts talking about environmental, social, and governance. But this really takes off, in my view, in 2016. And I, this is not intended as a political statement. It's intended as something that I think is reality. But there was a perceived void in regulatory action in this space. So who did people look to? Who did various groups look to? They looked to corporations. They said, the government's not taking action. We want corporations to take action. So I, I think as a result of that perception in the void, at least, there was more focus on companies. So it was building momentum. We saw in 2019, the Business Roundtable issued a pretty famous statement on the purpose of a corporation to include sustainability, supporting communities. Larry Fink through BlackRock also issued now kind of a very instrumental letter talking about how he was gonna use sustainability in his investments, kind of shocked the conscience at the time, but now it's well understood. But getting back to my point earlier, I think the real catalyst for this was what happened after the last time I was at Pace, you know, a month or two later, the, the COVID pandemic. And I, I, think, I think COVID has really, history will look on this as the transformational moment in this movement for two reasons. One is when, when COVID happened, and if you would watch CNBC, and I do, um, hopefully not everybody does, or you watch Jim Cramer, it was shocking, it was not shocking, but it was, it was impactful to me that you would see CEOs go on CNBC. What would they talk about as the first thing? They would talk about what they're doing to keep their employees safe while promoting the nation's infrastructure, keeping everything running. And before you go on CNBC, you talk about cash flow, um, EPS, you know, innovation, new products coming online. This was the big thing. Every CEO came on, safety, 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 how we're keeping people safe. So they've taken a classic ESG criteria, made it the most important thing they were doing at the time. So that was number one. Number, so they elevated the role of ESG right then and there. Number two was, we saw companies come together and start to think about how can we be part of the solution? Maybe we make cars, but we need to make ventilators. Maybe we make masks somewhere in Iowa, but we're gonna ship them over to China. How can we come together as using our corporate resources to do public good, to be part of the solution? So if you take the momentum that was growing and you take the impact of COVID and this transformational change, it really, in my mind, because we were living all this, I was living it very closely, cemented this new phase of corporate social responsibility. And we saw it in 2021 last year, the rise of ESG, commitments towards net zero. And now we're seeing these, these looking ahead to 2030, 2050 with commitments. We'll come back and talk about that in a little more detail. So if we go to the, the next slide, again, so here's the evolution of corporate social responsibility. We start with the public good. And then we had this more passive period where there was interest in the impacts, trying to understand them. It was like, tell me about your impacts. I want to understand them and so on. But now we've transitioned, I think as a result of COVID to this notion of an active role for businesses to be part of the solution for corporate social responsibility, to be kind of an actor looking to solve these issues. So now we'll turn the kind of, you know, how this all ties together into the, the who, what, how, and when, if we go to the next slide. And, and we'll go ahead and, and, and skip that. And then, so this is a slide I showed before. This is, you know, my proposition that we had a good start to environmental progress, more flat in the climate change area. And basically we need new tools that we had been using the same tools in the toolbox. So we basically, that wasn't working. That was what I said at Pace two years ago. We needed new tools. And so lo and behold, two years later, if we go to the next slide, we can change the tools. We can, this is what I was looking for two years ago. Now we can do it. We can actually bring new tools to the issue. And that's what I'm calling the global sustainability era. So let's, let's break this down. This is where we'll spend the next 10 minutes or so the rest of our presentation. We'll, we'll look at this and see how these tools are changing and why this gives me optimism that we're gonna be able to pick up on that, that progress. So let's go to the next slide, please. 
And we'll start with the catalyst. This is, this is a big change. If, if you think about the history of environmental law, it's been governments in the lead, maybe citizens, maybe NGOs, everybody trying to get at the table. Can they bring a citizen suit? Do they have standing to do so? Um, what party can challenge what? Is there public participation? This is fundamentally different than that because with corporate social responsibility, the role of the public, the role of stakeholders is built in from day one. And look at who has the influence here. Number one, employees. Um, if you're at a company, as I am, the, 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 the group you're hearing from most of the day on a daily basis, on a regular basis, are the employees. Employees, and you can read about this all over the place, have never been more focused on the mission of what they're doing. They wanna spend their time in the workday, the great resignation, focused on understanding how what they're doing is contributing in some meaningful way to be part of the solution. So more than anything, from a re retention standpoint, from a recruitment standpoint, being able to articulate your mission that's aligned with what your employees' goals are has become a fundamental game changer in how companies are, are, are thinking of policies and listening to their employees and, and making sure they're part of this. But then beyond that are customers. Um, every business needs to have customers. Every business needs to sell things to customers and be successful in competing against other companies with their customers. Customers are increasingly you know, wanting to find out about their company's performance on environmental, social, and governance, ranking that as a factor as they want to decide who to do business with. So if that's a factor, that's going to drive a company to be successful. Same thing with investors and financiers. We spend so much time talking about regulations and court challenges and the Supreme Court, they can do this or that. You can really drive behavior and outcome if you're deciding, here's how I'm going to spend my money. Here's who I'm going to invest in. Here's who I'm going to loan money to. You don't need to do notice and comment rulemakings for things like that. There's no litigation around that. And so the notion of sustainable finance, which in my view is perhaps the most impactful of all these topics, who are you gonna lend money to, who are you gonna invest in based on this performance has fundamental ramifications. There's something in the EU called the EU taxonomy. If you're not familiar with it, very complicated, classic EU, but this has been like their number one policy issue for the last six months. It's all over the news right now because they're basically setting a taxonomy like an encyclopedia dictionary on what are green investments and where they wanna channel money to. It's not a regulation, but it's having that impact of, of what, what, what technologies, what kind of companies are gonna thrive in this era. And then of course we have the activists, we have the NGOs, they have, we have governments, they all have roles to play. I don't mean to be dismissive of that. They have very important roles. They're gonna continue those roles and talk about the role of government. But the difference is we have this much broader group of people at the table who are callous to this. And that goes back to my definition of corporate social responsibility. It's broader than companies. It's this much more holistic approach towards partnership and driving outcomes towards these issues. So if we go to the next one, the, the actor, you probably predicted this, this is not a surprise. The actor here, unlike the government, it's, it's multinational companies, all kind of the resources and the global scale. GE is a company that works in 170 countries. Um, I don't know any other entity on the planet that can more sophisticated get into any region of the world and understand what they need for precision healthcare, to keep people connected for affordable, reliable, sustainable electricity and bring that talent, those resources to help tailor solutions. So as we're looking at global challenges, you wanna have global um, resources. You wanna have global companies, multinational companies, bring those resources to the table and bring that expertise to the table. And there's many different ways companies can do that. But to me, the, the theme that resonates the most is innovation and technology. If we're really gonna solve these issues, it's not gonna be policy, it's not gonna be you know, laws and things like that. Those are important but we need the technology, we need the next level step, we need to innovate that technology. You see some of the technology behind me here um, that's critical to this innovation. It's gonna be the companies that do it. They may partner with governments, they may partner with other groups, but that technical expertise, that scale, those investments to innovate, that's gonna be what solves these problems. So the companies have a critical role to play here. And then if we go to the, the next one here, the goal please. Um, we can debate, we can have a debate. Is it climate change? Is it sustainability? Is it access to water? I think of the goal here very simplistically. Uh, it's equity. It's not a simplistic concept, but it's a, it's a word, you know, in one word. And to me, it all comes back to equity, the notion that everyone on the planet has the right to prosper. They have the right to have access to healthcare. They have the right to have access to economic opportunities. They have the right to be protected from the environment from climate change, they have the right to have access to affordable, reliable, sustainable electricity. So kids can turn the lights on, you have access to healthcare and so on. You, want, you really want everyone to have the notion that you have the equal opportunity to have a prosperous life, to have a, a good quality of life. And that 
it's not so much climate change, it's not so much sustainability. This notion of equity is kind of what drives, I think, the thinking here. And again, this is not just me. I have the SDGs here. This refers to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. The UN has set 17 Sustainable Development Goals. I think these are just brilliant. I don't think anyone can improve on it. Because what the UN has done is says, core to sustainability is what we all think of. Protection from climate change, a clean environment, access to water, access to clean air. Um, but they also think in terms of more broader equity, making sure people have access to healthcare, to affordable, reliable, sustainable electricity, to access to economic opportunities so they can prosper, so they can stay connected. And you hear this term a lot, a just transition. The notion that we wanna decarbonize, we wanna solve these issues, but we need to make sure we're maintaining and promoting people's ability to prosper, ability to have a quality of life. So this is really, I think, what we're solving for. And this is where I think companies, again, with their, their scale, their reach, their expertise in these areas with these stakeholders can really focus and, and achieve this goal of, of how do we lift the equity? How do we look for, you know, make sure we're promoting the right to prosper? And technology is, again, back to my theme of innovation and technology, nothing can do more to advance that than technology. Think of healthcare. Um, it's not something we always think of with sustainability. Half the world's population is underserved with access to precision healthcare. If we can make like the machine you see behind me here more portable, uh, more accessible, use artificial intelligence, we can reach populations we can't reach today. It's a core sustainability goal and something that companies can do to innovate through technology. So if we go to the next slide, approach. From a legal perspective, this one, this one's really interesting because the way things work today is a company does something, you know, maybe the government finds out about it, they send a letter, you exchange information, you get the lawyers involved, you know, there's negotiations, takes years, you might litigate at the end of the day, you pay a penalty and so on. Who knows how that plays out over time? It's worked well so far, but with this pace, what we have here in this world is almost instantaneous accountability because there's so much focus through environmental social governance, ESG, on transparency, on communicating metrics, on being accessible and transparent. So we produce sustainability reports, we produce quarterly reports, annual reports, lots of information out there that gives a lens into how a company is doing. But what you don't see kind of behind the scenes and what I do every single day is meet with all the people that we have as catalysts. I meet with our employees, I meet with our customers, I meet with our investors. They all have lots of questions and they're, they don't call me up because like they want to congratulate me on something. They call me up because they're concerned. They have a question. They need follow-up information. Maybe they want to push us to do something more. Um, I welcome these conversations. They're very constructive, but that's what we spend our time doing is listening to these stakeholders, sharing information, hearing what they think we should be doing better, how we can reach some compromise. And they know that, you know, if, if, if we'll try to work it out, but if, if, if we don't, they have their own tools. They have their own mechanisms to push things much quicker than the government can. So we have this like almost instantaneous accountability on these issues. But having said that, there's some things to work on here too. Um, you know, we don't have kind of a standardized system for how companies report. There's a lot of concern about greenwashing, about overstating issues. We share those concerns. I share those concerns. I'm happy to talk about that and all the things we do to address those proactively. But I, I think what we're trending more towards over time is more of an apples to apples type approach here. So all companies are on a level playing field because me, I live this every day. I can see very quickly what a company is doing and perhaps maybe be a little disingenuous in something they're communicating, maybe something that's not quite credible, but it takes a while to get into the footnotes and figure that out. So I think we're seeing a more of a movement towards standardization here and more transparency so that people do have a sense of apples to apples comparisons among companies. Now, in terms of politics, if we go to the next slide. Um, I talked about kind of how stuck things are, right? That's not my view. I think everybody would, would probably acknowledge that at the moment. Good work on the infrastructure bill, progress continues on Build Back Better and the climate provisions and so on. But what's important here is that the government is a complementary partner. The government can help enable success, accelerate success, but this work is gonna happen with or without the government for all the reasons we talked about, all these stakeholders, they're gonna demand it, they're gonna account for it, companies are committing to it. So here the role of government is to, to help enable success. And I see lots of good things happening in the US and the UK and the EU for like partnerships on demonstration projects through tax incentives. Like the most important thing we can do right now for renewable energy, it's not the clean power plan, it's not the clean energy payment program, it's not a clean energy center, it's tax incentive. This is like tax law that's impacting environmental policy at this point. Um, 
So the government can be a partner. They can help accelerate things, and we, we welcome that. But the good news is when that's not going so well, at times it isn't, it doesn't necessarily slow things down. There's things that could improve, like permitting, streamlining, and things like that. But this is kind of happening on its own with, with collaboration. I, I do want to recognize, I do think the Biden administration has been quite strategic here with their all of the government approach with the infrastructure bill, and as has the UK and the EU, and recognizing that perhaps this is, this is a, a strong role for governments to be working as partners on innovating the technology, on creating the success here for these technologies to, to, to move forward. And then finally, in terms of programs and how we kind of um, progress, how we measure progress. Again, this is something that sets itself self up very well for a company. Companies are accountable uh, financially. They have to report quarterly earnings. They have to set goals. They have to set targets. And what we're seeing increasingly is that ESG reporting is, is transitioning to the level of financial reporting in terms of targets, in terms of you know, anticipate, transparency and rigor around it. I'm doing a podcast at GE for our employees only where we go behind the scenes of how we do sustainability. And the number one issue we're starting with is auditing. It doesn't sound like the world's most exciting topic, but it's one of the most important. How do we make sure that everything we share in this space has been audited through the ringer because the worst thing we could do is share something that, that isn't fully accurate or we haven't fully checked. And we're going to start with this podcast with all the things we do to make sure everything we share is credible and all the work that goes into that behind the scenes. So companies are looking to targets 2025, 2030, 2050 to create this trajectory of where we get to these goals. Totally the opposite of how we did it in the past where you would look at something based on technology, set a standard, litigate it, maybe a couple of years, revisit it, ratchet it up, litigate it, ratchet it up and so on. We're looking to the future, finding that trajectory. Now, I'm not suggesting it's going to be an easy ride or a straight glide path. We're going to have some years we'll do well. We're going to have some years that things aren't going to work out. No one can predict how this technology will play out. But the point is, people are investing in it. They're, they're setting their goals towards it. And they're doing it at the right time. We're looking at technology today that 10 years, 12 years from now, we may or may not use. But we have to be looking that far ahead. And we'll have some years where we'll underperform, but we'll be transparent about it. We'll explain what went wrong. We'll explain what we're doing about it. We hope people give you know, some patience on that, but at least we know that this is a glide path and this is what we're setting towards where we're gonna end up. So just two more slides here. I just think to wrap this up, um, this brings me back to the who, the what, the how, and the when. Two years ago at Pace, I asked for new tools. I didn't predict this probably. I maybe sensed it was coming, but I feel like we've got, we've got the evolution of new tools that are gonna help address these issues. And then just to summarize all this at the last slide. So, you know, 50 years in, I, I do think it's fair to say we're in the midst of a needed transformation where corporate social responsibility is, um, is, is gonna be leading some of this progress in the future. I know that's provocative, but I think it's necessary. I think it's okay. Um, I think if we think about it and know it's broader than a company, there's not, you know, un companies unleashed here. This is a lot of accountability, a lot of transparency, a lot of work with these stakeholders to do this process. Um, so these catalysts are broadening. It, public participation is something that's always been a challenge. It's really baked in the corporate social responsibility. And I think that's a really positive thing. The role, government has an important role to play, but it's very complementary. It's to help set up the success of these goals, to partner together. And partnership is terrific. And I, I, I love all the chances I have to meet with the government, whether it's here or around the world, um, to set up those partnerships. is probably one of the, the most rewarding things we get to do. Lawyers are certainly part of the solution. This is, a, this is a whole, we could probably easily spend a lot of time just on what is the role of the lawyer here? It's probably the question I get the most. There's certainly a role for lawyers and lawyers are gonna be critical to working all these issues out. We can have some discussion on where that is, but the, the thing I would leave you with is the most important thing you can do is be a really good lawyer, whatever kind of lawyer you wanna be, because sustainability touches everything we do. Employment law, uh, human, human rights, securities and governance, finance, um, beyond just the environmental and the climate change. And we just need lawyers who are really, really good at being good lawyers and, and they can help us on sustainability. But that's, that's what I try to encourage people to do. Just, just pursue what you want to do, but have that sustainability lens. And there's just huge demand for that. And the last thing I want to leave it with is the point I made earlier that I'm not speaking for all companies here. I'm speaking for how we think of things at, at G, how I think of things even if I'm being you know, fully fair, which is that equity is the goal. And, and Last year, I had the chance in some of my travels to, to, to be in a place where um, people can't always kind of speak up and share how they think of these issues where they're under you know, various restrictions that, that could 
you know, penalized for certain things they can say in the space. And so someone who was in this environment said, what's been kind of my North star, the most impactful thing I've ever heard anybody say about sustainability. And you see it there, every life is important. Every person matters. That's not from me. This is from this unnamed person who I got to spend some time with who said it kind of very quietly under her breath. That has been kind of my North star since on how we look at these issues. Every life is important. Every person matters. We still have to, we, we care about shareholders too. You know, I've, I'm a shareholder. We want to see that happen. But this is, I think, how we think of sustainability, how we think of ESG is driving us towards that lifting up uh, the quality of life of people globally towards uh, opportunities for a more prosperous lifestyle, healthcare, economic opportunities, protection from the environment, energy, and so on. And it's what will drive me, I think, to continue to be committed to these issues. So Professor Q, thank you for, again, the honor. I'm really humbled to have the chance to share these thoughts. It gave me an opportunity to kind of myself reflect on the pace of this, which has been moving so quickly the last couple of years and try to connect some dots here. So I, I appreciate that very much. Well, thank you very much. This brings us to the, to the um, uh, question portion uh, session of our talk between our attendees and our distinguished lecture. And I want to thank you, I, I will say for me, you've given us a really useful analytical framework and context that helps make sense, I think, of some changes that we all ex are experiencing or seeing, and it's incredibly compelling to see them through the lens um, of the framework that you've suggested. So if you have yet to do so, I would invite our attendees to submit your questions um, for Roger via the link and code provided in the chat. We probably won't have time for every question, but we'll do our best to provide you the opportunity to ask as many questions as time allows. And I wanted to start out, I, I think our first question, I know we have um, attendees from all over the world from a range of industries, but you're here today with us at pa Pace Powell Law, and we're joined by many law professors, law students, um, and colleagues in the legal field. And I wanted to invite you to expand on your discussion of the role of lawyers and, and, and law students in terms of contributing to the global sustainability era. And maybe think about if you had a piece of advice for a law student tuned in today who was really eager to push things forward, what you might suggest. Thank you for that. And, and it is probably the question I get the most from law students and from, from lawyers, because this is a very rapidly growing area of the law based on my in email inbox every day that I get from law firms with various alerts on this space. And I think it goes back to my simple proposition that we don't really look to hire a lot of sustainability lawyers. I actually do have a really great sustainability lawyer that I tend to go to as my trusted source on this, but she's kind of rare and an exception. Our team is built out by um, employment lawyers, human rights lawyers, governance, securities, shareholder lawyers, corporate lawyers, um, and you know, looking for the best in the field, but who can also help us translate what they do into this realm, into this universe. So I, you know, one piece of advice I, I have is, in, in, as well as my own, own class at Howard, is I, I think people should continue to do what they feel most passionate about in the practice of law, if that's corporate law, employment law, um, human rights law, and so on. But, but, but it's okay to do it with a sustainability lens, but that, that to me is where the real demand is. It's very rare that we would have a need for kind of someone who's a full-time 100% sustainability lawyer. And frankly, it's rare that we really need to have someone who calls himself an ESG expert, which a lot of people do. What I wanna hear is you know, from, from that, that employment lawyer, who's a great employment lawyer, but who understands the pressure that some people are feeling on, you know, should ESG be part of compensation metrics and so on, but she, but she comes to it from this employment background that's really solid, but she can help me understand the ESG consequences of that. So I think there's just so many, it touches on everything at this point. There's so many opportunities to be in so many different areas of the law, but to have this maybe be a focus, something that you're, you're committed to, but have that solid background uh, to start with. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'll move to our, our next question. Um, which asks about notes that the EU has sustainable finance disclosure regulation and wonders what your opinion is about enforcing mandatory sustainability disclosure in the United States. Sure. So thank you for the question. So when you're a global company in this area that you tend to focus on the EU first and foremost, it would be a mistake, even though we're headquartered in the US to have a US centric lens on this because the EU is far out ahead in this area. The U US is catching up, but the EU is just far out ahead. It's, it's, they take a fundamentally different approach to sustainability 
where they see it as kind of the, the core of their social fabric at this point. So the EU is doing a number of things. I mentioned the taxonomy, which directs investments in what they call green technologies or transitional technologies. It's been pretty controversial recently, if you've seen the news on it. And the question about the corporate uh, social reporting directive that, that the question that came from, this is, this is among a theme that I mentioned where we're seeing ESG reporting rise to the level of financial reporting. You think of all the rigor and the consequences of financial reporting, this is the EU's effort to bring it with that same rigor. We're gonna see a proposal in the US in the next few weeks from um, the SEC and Secretary Gensler. And it's gonna do kind of the equivalent in the US. I don't think it's gonna be quite as ambitious. The EU is looking at sustainability as a whole. The US is more focused on climate change emissions. So we're gonna to start to see that first round of US regulations elevating these issues to the same rigor as financial reporting. In theory, I would welcome this because it gets back to the apples and apples approach. We'd like to see everybody playing on a level playing field. The devil's always in the details. You know, this is a proposal. There was an advanced notice proposed rulemaking, a uh, number of groups looked at that. So we'll look at, we'll look at the details, but I've been encouraged that Secretary Gensler has been pretty transparent in how he's thinking about it. And it seems like he's, he's coming down on a pragmatic view on it that I think will help bring some rigor to this and some consistency, but hopefully also not jump ahead too soon as, as, as we're trying to figure out some of these, these far, farther reaching areas of this space. Great, thank you. Um, so we have another question about um, whether you think that companies setting lofty sustainability goals like net zero targets and carbon offsets, is that a competitive advantage, a competitive disadvantage as compared to companies who haven't adopted those kind of targets? It's a, it's a great question. And I think the reality is going back to the stakeholders, your employees, your customers, your investors. I think I did the research recently. I think it's only like 22% of the Fortune 500 companies have set these, these goals, which I was surprised it was not higher. But it's, it's becoming, I think, more of a competitive disadvantage, I would say. It, maybe perhaps it depends on the industry. Maybe some industries can buy a little more time. But from what we're seeing from our stakeholders, including our investors who can you know, approach shareholder resolutions and, and bring the vote to the shareholders, um, th there's, there's an increasing expectation on, on these issues. And we have a lot of dialogue with them to make sure we're staying in lockstep with their expectations. I would say it's increasing a disadvantage to not be thinking through some of these, stand these um, targets. This is from my colleague, uh, Nick Robinson at Pace. And, and he asks, notes that manufacturing and banks appear to accept corporate social responsibility, but that the extractive industries are less accepting. And he notes hydrofracking as an example. How do you have any ideas about bringing those types of companies into the corporate social responsibility movement? Thank you, Professor. Good to hear from you. Um, and I think that goes to the theme from earlier that I think different industries are feeling different sets of pressures and are differently positioned based on kind of where they're operating and how they've been thinking about these issues. I think the things like the European Sustainability Directive, the SEC rule that's coming out, that will start, I think, to, to set a floor, set a standard for where corporations are going to be. And I think a lot of it has to do with what are they hearing from their, I know what I'm hearing from our employees, I know what I'm hearing from our investors, from our customers. We're in the renewable energy space, we're in the healthcare space. Frankly, some of the things we're hearing from them might be a little different than the fossil fuel industries we're in. There might be a different set of motivations and pressures. And so I could see how that could filter to different industries. Um, healthcare, renewable energy, I think are in the leading edge of this. Some other sectors more in the middle, some other sectors behind. But I, I, I do think, you know, it's a question of time and, and how, quickly this catches up to different industries and, and giving people time to, to think through that. Great, thank you. Um, and we have another question about kind of whose voice gets heard and reflected in corporate social responsibility. And, and so this person asks, if employees, consumers, and shareholders are sources of accountability, how do you assure every person really does matter when many don't fit in those buckets? It's a great question. And, and what you're right that not everybody does fit in those buckets. And a lot of the people I'm thinking about probably are not investors in the, the General Electric company or buying our products. We actually don't sell things to, to those people anymore. Um, but what, what we do do is we have a commitment as part of our ESG commitment. Our ESG commitment is to improve our impacts. And our commitment to improve our impacts is to our people, 
that's our employees and everybody who works with us, our contractors. We want to make sure they're safe. We want to address human rights. We want to have an ethical supply chain. Um, but we also have a commitment to our communities. And, and this is to making sure that we're working with our communities to address these impacts and to um, also work through philanthropy. So let me just give two quick examples of that. We do have a program called Next Engineers where we've, we've committed to go into cities in the, around the world globally that are underrepresented in the STEM uh, careers where we have uh, women and, and um, other minority populations who are just underrepresented in STEM and to create high school programs to, to make STEM more accessible to underserved populations in these cities. So that's one way we're impacting our communities. Another way is through environmental justice. It's something that, again, I could spend an hour on, but I'm really proud of a program we have, which is traditionally when you look at brownfields, which are contaminated properties that you want to resell, you, you tend to prioritize those investments based on the commercial return. So if Amazon wants to build a data center, you're going to clean up that property. Um, what we came to find, um, and we were surprised by that, what, we were surprised, I guess, but unsurprised too, is that when you prioritize properties based on environmental justice criteria, percentage of people who are undereducated, impoverished, black populations, the, the, the ranking becomes not so much about commercial viability, but, but you know, where they rank in that system. And what we, what we try to do at GE is to say, we can't let these properties just sit there. That's a blight for these communities. It's a blight for the neighborhood. So even if there's not as much a commercial case to be made, we're gonna invest in the cleanup of those properties and then restore them to a useful purpose for the community, such as a training center, for renewable energy or so on. We're working on this today. And that's what, another way we intersect with our communities and those voices who otherwise aren't represented through uh, those categories that I identified. Great, thank you. So we've got a question now on greenwashing and someone would like to know, can you expand on mitigating greenwashing concerns? How can we believe a company that produces a particular product, but then lobbies against climate change regulation that impacts that product adversely? So maybe this is, question is about the communication between um, ESG goals at a company and government lobbying. Yeah, it, it's a really fair, Point and something I feel really passionate about. As I said, this is this is what I picked as our first internal blog. Um, how you know someone in our business wants to say, "I've got this product. Let's call it green," and all of a sudden, a bunch of us raise it. No, we're not going to call it green. We have to explain why. So our, our approach, and this is an area with that, I won't pretend that we're perfect. I don't think anybody is, but we do see a wide range of response to this, and I think people have a right to be concerned. If I'm being honest. Um, our approach is to focus on credibility. We act with urgency, but we speak with credibility. I'd rather be more boring on something than to overstate it, to be honest. And so we use a number of procedures internally to vet everything we say in this space. We do our site checking exercise, so it's beyond reproach. And if there's even a debate about whether we can say that or whether that's the right number, if we even debate it, we strike it. We're just gonna err on the side of, of that. We avoid semantical traps like green and clean and that we have the, the cleanest or the best and so on. We'd speak a little more neutrally on these things. And we go through all kinds of rigor to make sure like GE, GE's equipment powers one third of the world's energy. We went through like a multi-week site checking on that to make sure that was a statement we felt comfortable with. We had to tweak it a little bit when we actually ran the numbers. So we, we work very hard at that, but I see a lot of mix here with companies. I think people have a right to be concerned. In terms of the disconnect between what a company is doing internally and what it's saying publicly, again, or you know, behind the scenes, I think again, it's a fair concern. People should address this. This is a this is a very emerging topic, and that there's a lot of interest in companies kind of going to more detail on how they are lobbying for things. Are they saying one thing publicly and then they lobbying differently against it? So I would predict um, that you're going to see more transparency, more disclosure in this space of what our trade associations are doing, how we are um, advocating for things, um, not just us, I shouldn't say us, but companies in general. This is, I'd say a top three issue among our, our stakeholders right now, making sure that there's alignment between what a company is saying publicly and what it's actually doing. So there's gonna be a big push towards more transparency in this space. Thank you. So if someone else who's written in thinking about the role of government in the global sustainability area and asking whether government might actually be antagonistic to global sustainability and citing to laws 
um, that were, I think, proposed but not adopted, although I'm not sure, to punish firms for climate dis divestment, cited as an example. You know, I think it's, it's, it's a fair thing to be thinking about. And I think I can't speak for all countries. The one thing I'd say on this is I would, there are certainly countries, I imagine there are, I won't name any that probably may have mixed emotions on this. Um, and that's probably certainly true. The one thing I've observed in my travels is it's, it's easy for me to stereotype it. Like say, that's an oil rich company. Like they're not going to be on board with this. And I get there and I'm just shocked and amazed at how far ahead that they are when it comes to innovation technology and the investments they're making in decarbon. Maybe they have to, right? They know this is coming. But I think that's been the understated story when it comes to some of these countries that they don't, I think, always get the attention or the credit for the work they're doing on investing things. I think it's terrific that COP27 will be in Egypt and COP28 will be in the UAE. And I've seen some people go, oh, UAE, why did they pick them? I've been to the UAE and I've seen directly the, the types of investments at scale that we would be struggling to make to be part of the solution. So I think there's gonna be a real opportunity to highlight that innovation, not to take away from the question, because I think it's a very fair question. There are places, but I also just wanna caution that, that from my experience, it's worth taking a deeper look into some of these places where we might have assumptions. Great, and so I'm told we're short on time and this will be our last, um, our last question. Um, let's see. One of our viewers is interested about whether these corporate commitments are credible. Do companies audit and verify their results? And what is the enforcement mechanism that we're relying on? Sure, sure. So it, credibility is always going to be subjective. And from GE's perspective, we, we always highlight credibility, I would say, as the top issue. Again, I'd rather not say something than risk someone accusing me of not being credible. That's always my, my biggest fear. I can't promise I'll always get it right. But if I don't, I'm gonna share what I did wrong, where I could improve and how we're gonna fix it going forward. We're gonna be very transparent. But um, th there needs to be a high level of what we call data assurance around these statements. Sometimes that's done externally, sometimes that's done internally, sometimes that's a combination of both. You know, Any company will have big auditing teams. They're equipped at doing this as our financial advisory forms because of financial reporting. And so the, the, the trend here is to, br again, bring the rigor of ESG reporting up to where it is at financial reporting. It's not there today. Um, I think there's a lot of really strong energy towards it, but I, I think it is inevitable that we're gonna see ESG reporting with the same financial rigor as, um, as financial reporting. And in terms of accountability, I get back to some of the themes earlier, whether we're producing something in a sustainability report, a quarterly report, an annual report, or whether we're getting a call from an investor who's asking for that information and they're not shy, if they're one of your investors, if they're a customer, um, that's where the accountability comes in, in terms of, of making sure um, that, that you are you know, keeping to your commitments. And again, I don't do a lot of phone calls where people are taking time up of the day to say, I'm doing a great job. The phone calls I get are kind of the skeptical ones. Like, I really wanna dig into this data. I really wanna ask you about this human rights issue. You know, tell me more about this data or this, this controversy that you had. I really need to understand it. And um, that's a big part of what we do in, in, in companies is be responsive to those stakeholders and understanding the concerns that they have. Great, so that brings us to the end of our 2022 Curlin Lecture. I wanna thank Roger Martella for providing his valuable insight on these timely, this timely topic. And Roger, I raised this only because you did before you started talking. You mentioned it's a little embarrassing for people to walk out of an in-person lecture, but it's really easy for people to leave by Zoom. So I did check and you actually went up significantly oh. during the <laughs> I think people were, um, thank you for everyone for joining us. And apparently people were really um, glued glued to their seats. I want to give a special note of thanks um, to our environmental law fellow, Katie Horner, our assistant dean for external affairs, Rachel Silva, our environmental program coordinator, Ann Olson, our tech guru, Greg Likens, and Achinthi Bethanage, our associate director of environmental law programs for all of their hard work behind the scenes in pulling this event together. Thank you all uh, so very much.
Thank you again so much for joining us this evening. Um, as a reminder, today's event was recorded and will be uploaded to the Pace Law School website for future viewing. Finally, we encourage you to visit our Twitter page and share your comments about the event. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your evening.